Yeah, that will be playing next week. We'll get you all this. Okay. You should do better than I have could. <laughs> <laughs> all right, our first reading this morning is from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 55. You can find that in the Red Pew Bibles on page 498, Isaiah 55, verses 10 through 13. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy, and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Our New Testament reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 8. You can find that in the Pew Bibles on page 761. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, and I'll be reading this also in the English Standard Version. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned the sin in the flesh, in order that righteousness, oh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, indeed it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. If you'll turn with me this morning to the Gospel of Matthew for our Gospel reading. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, and you can find that on page number 658 of the Red Pew Bibles if you're following along in there. Matthew, chapter 13, and beginning in verses 1 through 9 and then dropping to verse 18. So Matthew, chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. <coughs> Hear now the Gospel of the Lord. <coughs> That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, 
And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, but since they had no depth of soil, they, the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them, and the other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Then dropping to verse 18, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what is sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for that which was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. May God indeed bless this reading of his holy word. May the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my God, my rock, and my redeemer. A familiar parable to many of us, yes? We call it the parable of the sower, but really it's more the parable of the soils. Okay? Because it's, it's not so much about the sower, it's about the ground on which the seed falls. And so it's really probably better called the parable of the soils or the parable of the, of the ground than, than the parable of the sower. Um, it's a familiar parable even to people who are what we call unchurched, to use the jargon. And I'm not going to dwell a whole, whole lot here, I don't think, or at least I'm not planning to. We kind of get the drill, right? We've all seen this and we've all fallen somewhere on this spectrum at one time or another. God sows something in our hearts, but our hearts are hard. And it just kind of bounces off and, and really doesn't have a chance to take root. You know, the soil is impacted. Anybody got impacted lawns? You got those bare patches in the lawn where it's impacted because the seed really has trouble getting through. And if it's an especially shady spot like we have and under some pine trees with those nice needles and, and all the acid, so you have that impacted acidy soil and that's just beautiful for moss, which is great to lie down on, but not so good for the lawn. Or as one friend of mine, when, when we were still in Massachusetts, we had a lawn that was essentially all dirt and moss and not a whole lot of grass. And this guy, at one point in his career, was a landscaper. He says, hey, it's green and you don't have to mow it. I wouldn't worry about it. But it was so easy to rip up, too. You know? So what do you do if you want lawn there? You have to get rid of the moss and you have to aerate the soil, you know, using either a bunch of spikes or a plug aerator or something like that to loosen the soil up. You spread a bunch of lime down and it kills off the moss. And then you've got to spread the seed and rake over it and, and water it and all that other fun stuff, right? Planting seed, sowing seed is work. Some of you have gardens, Bev. <laughs> and my in-laws too have you know, they, they, the house was on a little bit more than three quarters of an acre, and a third of that was garden. Beans, squashes of various sorts, kale. My mother-in-law had this thing about kale. Um, scallions, rhubarb, blueberry bushes, which still continue to produce to this day. And now they're getting to that point where we have to get out there and get some before the bears do. Yeah. But they spent a lot of time in that garden. They spent a lot of time tilling and weeding, right? Because that's what you got to do. Pruning, once it actually grows up, so that it becomes more fruitful. 
right? And so, too, with the gospel. Sometimes you're going to bring the gospel to somebody. They're going to be in the middle of a crisis, and you're going to bring a comfort from the Lord to them, or so you believe, and you will speak, God's got this. But if they're not ready to hear it, they're not going to receive it, right? That hard soil, that hard heart. And many of us at times were there. Probably every single one of us at times was there. I certainly was there at, at points in my life where people would give me counsel and they would just bounce off like the seeds on, on the impacted soil. And so any word that they had, even if I remotely kind of sort of received it and, and it laid there and it got rained on a little bit, the birds would get at it and, and off it would go. Same thing with the rocky soil, right? Anybody who's ever been out to a funeral out back here knows that we have a lot of those New Hampshire potatoes back there, right? I mean, there's more rock than dirt, and what dirt is there is pretty sandy. Not a whole lot of good for growing, which is probably why they donated this field to the church to build a church there. The field was probably just way too much work at the time. And... You look out there and when the drought hits, that grass does not really grow all that well because it's so rocky. And anybody who has that rocky soil in their yards, you know that drill too. You're constantly, every year you're pulling up a new crop of them rocks. I mean potatoes, I mean, you know. And that's why we have all those beautiful stone walls, you know, because they, <laughs> you know, we grow great stone walls here in New England. And, and so too, the plants, and, and sometimes you'll, you'll bring a word and they'll receive it with gratitude and they'll be very thankful and, and you'll see these little glimpses, but sooner or later, you know, something comes, they get invited to a party, their significant other would make, starts making fun of them for believing, maybe somebody in the family, a parent, child, sibling, and they just suddenly kind of drop off because that connection really isn't there. The roots aren't really that deep. And others of us, well, we've gone to church all our lives. But by church, we mean the local social club. A young doctor, well, not young anymore, but a doctor of my acquaintance when, when he was much younger and, and pretty much fresh out of his internship. <coughs> Moved to a town. First thing he was advised, join the church, join the Rotary, build your practice. Meet people, build your practice. Join the social clubs, build your practice. Join a church, build your practice. Not join the church, be strengthened in Jesus. Join the church. Meet people, build up your practice. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Maybe not so much up here, but, but down south, it's a real big thing. Um, and, you know, people get dressed up really, really nice. And they're in church every Sunday. Wouldn't miss it. Got to go to church on Sunday. Got to be seen. Got to see and be seen. Who's, oh, this one isn't there. They're backsliding. But the church is having no impact on the community and it withers away. Do you ever notice how many of those churches are in trouble? And now with this COVID thing, a lot of churches have been impacted and they don't know that they're gonna make it because everything just kind of dried up when the people stopped coming in the doors. Because there is no root. The cares of this world have choked it away. And, and, and every single one of us, I'm convinced, is probably guilty of that one again at some point in our lives. Yes, we put something before God. I was talking about our idols a couple of weeks ago. What are your idols? Is it the pursuit of your, your job, your career, money, family, status? Maserati, in my case, blue, not red. You stick, you, you stick five cars in a row. They're all, they're all just, you know, in a parking lot, five of them, one alongside the other. One of them is red, one of them is green, one of them is blue, one of them is black, one of them is whatever color. Which one's the one that gets ticketed for speeding? The red one, even though none of them are moving. So don't give me a red Maserati, please. And it chokes the word. 
because you're looking for something other than God. And then Jesus says, there's the one that lands on the good soil. The soil that has had the rocks removed from it. The soil that has been aerated. The soil that has been hoed and the weeds pulled out of it. The soil that is really ready to receive the seed. And they're the ones who grow deep, strong roots and flourish. Um, look around you right now. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine souls physically present in the sanctuary right now. And that's actually a big number for us, right? And a couple of our regulars aren't here. Plus a few that are still sheltering. A church this size should not be open at this stage of the game. We, of all churches, should be on life support. And for many years, this church was on life support. And yet, because of pointing at the cross, you're pointing at the Holy Spirit. We are on life support, yeah. But we are plugged in with him who is the true vine, the Lord Jesus. And as you come out for the studies and, and for everything else, you know, I mean, we have fun, we goof off, we laugh a lot, we make huge mistakes, and, and not just in the music. Um, I've, I've made errors in the teaching. I've, I've stated something because I'm brain dead, and, and no, wait, it was supposed to be this, not that. I'm sorry. But we also take the teaching seriously don't we? And I'm watching all of you who are regulars or even semi-regular at, at our Tuesday night studies and how far you've all come in your understanding and, and in your, not, not just your knowledge of what's in the Bible and what's not, but putting pieces together now and saying, hey, wait, this reminds me of, and, and when I throw out those little things like, I'll ask a question and somebody will answer, I'll go, well, why do you say that? And now you're starting to come up with why you say that. And it's a biblical reason. And I am thrilled. Why? Because the roots are growing deeper. The numbers are not great. They're still really, really, really small, which again came in handy during COVID because we never broke nine. I don't think we ever broke eight, did we? While we were under the under the nine or under? Did we ever hit nine? Maybe Easter. <laughs> But the roots are stronger. And as Jennifer pointed out during the missions moment, in that quarter, the giving actually went up. Yeah, thank God is doing something. You think there's anything that we need to be afraid of? No. No. And we are not afraid because we have that strong root system growing. Now, it could be stronger. We have our weeds, we have our rocks still. It could stand a little more shade. There might be a couple of trees that still need to be cut down. But we're growing. And there's that Yankee Amen. There you go. <laughs> I live for those. That's the, you know, that's one of my idols and something I need to put to death. But isn't that kind of what Isaiah was talking about in the passage that Jennifer read. Yes, you need to run, I know. I know it's, push, it's pushing up against that time. Yes, you, have deep, you do have deep roots. And that's why I'm not worried in your absence. It talks about even the wagon tracks being full of what? No, that was the, that was the, that was the, 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 the psalm, the call to worship. The mountains and the hills breaking forth and singing, the trees and the fields clapping their hands, making the rain and snow come down from heaven, bringing forth the vegetation, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, and so, does, so is the word that comes out of the mouth of God. And that's what's been happening here, is that Isaiah prophecy has been coming through. But 
we still have weeds. We still have rocks, as I was saying earlier. And we talked about that last week with, with Paul in Romans 7 and what a wretched man that I am, that which I want to do, I don't, that which I don't want to do, that I do. And, and we, all, we all wrestle with that, right? We, we get it up here. Like when we come down to here, not so much. The long 12 inches or nine inches or whatever from head to heart, isn't it? And, and like the Apostle Paul, we go, I know it's the right thing, but I really like sin. You know, this is, this is the sin. But it's not sin. It, in, in, it's, it's sin in us, that residual sin, that, that old person, that old man, that old woman that, that needed to be crucified still raises up every now and again. And then we sit there and we kick ourselves for weeks on end because we were so stupid and we listened to the darkness. And Paul takes aim at that now. Because where God has said, you are forgiven, you are clean, we don't need to beat ourselves up anymore. Because God has already said, you're covered. Yes, it was boneheaded. It was dumb. It was sin. But I forgive you. It's over. It's done. And as an old mater day of mine used to say, forget about. Because now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Doesn't mean there is condemnation once you have sinned. That, okay, you're back under condemnation again. But because that's our default setting, isn't it? That's how we feel. That we've done the stupid thing, we have betrayed our God, we have sinned, and like Peter, we go and he when when Jesus looks at us, we fall apart in 14 different ways. But he calls us alongside that fire along the lake and says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And restores us because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who are united with him who is the true vine. The law of the spirit of life has set us free in Christ from the law of sin and death. Right? The wages of sin is death. When you sin, you die. End of conversation. And Jesus died because he was just so full of sin, right? Good question. Think about this for a minute. Yes, he never sinned in his lifetime. But he bore our sins, exactly. So he died bearing our sins. So he never sinned. But we sinned, and he took the penalty for our sins. He took the condemnation. He was condemned. He who was innocent was condemned and died. He didn't swoon. He didn't faint. He didn't somehow wiggle off the cross and, and come back to and be revived. He died so that we might live. There is no longer condemnation. That condemnation has already been set. Are we guilty? Not anymore. We have been freed. We have been declared justified. And we are sanctified, made holy, cleansed by his blood. For God has done what the law, which was weakened by the flesh, could not do. Jennifer and I met while we were in a law-based cult. Okay. It was a Bible-based cult, but we believed, and this cult taught, that the law was binding on Christians. The Old Testament law of Moses was binding on all Christians. The Saturday Sabbath, the clean and unclean meats, that whole bit of business. We did not celebrate Easter. We did not celebrate Christmas. We did not celebrate birthdays. Those were pagan things. Those were things that Christians did not celebrate. Those are things that were not commanded by God in the Bible. What was commanded by God in the Bible was not Sunday observance, but Saturday observance. What was commanded by God in the Bible was not Christmas, but the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Sukkot, the, the Feast of, of Unleavened Bread. We kept Passover. We, we cleaned all the leaven out of our house except for beer. Mm -hmm. 
My first Passover with this group, I was offered a beer. And I worked for Jewish people. I knew this whole Passover thing, and beer was there bought. And, oh no, it's a different kind of yeast. It's okay. I mean, right then and there, I should have known that something was up. I know somebody else who used to keep two boxes of baking soda. One box of baking soda was used for cooking, and because that was a leavening agent, it was thrown out. But the other box would either be put into the refrigerator to absorb all the smells, or used simply for cleaning. And so it was okay to have that. The things we do when we are under law. And that's what Paul means by weakened by the flesh. We look for these loopholes. It just so happens that the founders of this cult were very fond of alcoholic beverages. And so they looked for a loophole to be able to drink beer during the days of unleavened bread. Which doesn't exactly square with the reason that certain beers were created in the first place. Because some of those old monks were forbidden from eating solid food. And so they took grain, water, and yeast, changed their proportions, so instead of a dough that rose that you baked, they would make a fermented beverage with those very same ingredients and drink their bread. The, keeping the law does not save us because we look for ways around it. How many of us as we're going up 93, all right, you start out south of Concord, you hit that 55 zone as, as you're coming into the interchanges, and you do 55 at all times, and then when it loosens up a little bit after the exit 19, or not 19, um, the exit for the for the monitor and, and, and whatnot, where it, where it goes up again, and then once you hit Canterbury, it goes up to 70? How many of us are doing 70 through, down, through, through the Concord stretch? How, how many of us try to hold the speed limit, but, well, everybody else is going faster, and I really don't want to get rear-ended, so maybe I'll just go a little bit faster so I won't be noticed, I won't be out of line. So are we keeping the law? Or are we just looking for that little edge? And so the law, which was good and right, according to Paul, resulted in death because you looked for ways around it. How can I work on the Sabbath without working on the Sabbath? I need to get this done, but the sun is down. What do you do? I mean, I, I had this crisis on my hand. when I lived in a rental place. My landlady lived upstairs. It was, there were two apartments below and one apartment above. And the garbage used to get picked up on Wednesdays and Saturdays. And so I would put my garbage out once a week on Wednesdays. I didn't generate a whole lot of stuff, just needed to put it out once a week. A couple of years into this, my landlady decided she was going to go with Saturday only pickup. But the town says you can't put the garbage out more than 12 hours before it's supposed to be picked up, which means it's already dark on Friday night by the time you are allowed to put the garbage out. What do you do? Because bringing the garbage out to the curb, which for me was about from this wall of the sanctuary to the wall between the kitchen and the fellowship hall it was about that length from my door to the, cur to, the, to the road. That's work. What do you do? Let the garbage build up. I had a cat with a litter, but you know, in a litter box, you needed to get that stuff out. You can't put it on Friday night, it's too early. <coughs> yes, there was, right at the end of the driveway. Which is what a lot of Jews do. You know, they have special, they have Sabbath elevators, special elevators on the Sabbath, just stop at every floor. Or they have somebody that can push the buttons for them or flip the light switches for them. And, and, and my, my pastor said, for crying out loud, put the garbage out, it's an ox in the ditch. The law weakened by the flesh does not save, because we're always looking for a way around it. But grace saves us. Jesus saves us. It's our union with him that saves us. 
And it's our union with him that causes the fruitfulness to come. And this church has been growing in fruitfulness, hasn't it? For years, people didn't even know this church existed. They thought it had closed. Oh, is that church still open? Yeah, it's still open. I don't hear that too much anymore. I'm in town a lot more than I used to be. So when the gospel is not always well received by others, when we attempt to bring it, don't worry about it. If the word bounces off of somebody, ask the Lord, how is this hard heart to be aerated? When the word takes a little bit of root, but then something happens and they kind of bail, ask the Lord, am I to remove the stones or is somebody else to do that? When we see somebody whose Christian walk is being compromised by growing more and more and more and more into the things of the world, how, ask the Lord, how is it that we are to help to weed this person's soul, to weed this person's life. And very often that person is us, by the way, not necessarily somebody else. Our blueberry bushes are doing okay. But to be honest, they could be doing better. They have not been weeded since, that's been at least two years now since the weeds have been put. I actually have to mow the area underneath the blueberry bushes because the weeds have gotten so bad. They hadn't been pruned until, you know, for about two or three years now. But they're still fruitful because the roots are deep. And so every now and again, things are going to choke our lives. But if our roots are deep, we'll get through it. Sometimes things are going to distract us and the devil is good at that. That's, that's what he wants to do. He wants to distract us from the things that are important. But if our roots are deep, we'll always come back. We cannot walk alone. We can't do it alone. We need each other to help. We need to be receptive of, of that which others see, both to encourage as well as to correct. And when we kick ourselves, we have to remember that we are in the spirit, not in the flesh. And every now and again, the flesh is going to raise its ugly head. But we, when we kick ourselves and say, oh, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, I'm so awful, are actually telling God that he's wrong. Because if God has forgiven us, who then? can condemn us, not the devil, not our neighbors, not even us, because God is our judge and God alone. And if he says that if you are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation, then if you are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation, none, zero, zip, nada. Hallelujah, indeed. Hallelujah, indeed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that when we are in Christ, there is no condemnation. That you, Lord Jesus, condemned sin in the flesh and fulfilled the requirement of the law for us, even though we, in our boneheadedness, even though we, in our rocky soiled hearts, even though we, in our weird, cho weed choked ways, do not always walk in your path. Lord Jesus, you have forgiven us and have covered us with, with your blood and your wings and your cloak. So Holy Spirit, we ask that when we get down on ourselves about our sin, that you convict us because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you. And we honor you and we give you glory in your mighty name. And all the gathered said, Amen.